it's Dr. Ken here with you, Magnetism. This is Lesson 5, our little practical to reinforce what induction and mutual induction is. So, we're going to be looking at mutual induction. So, what are the objectives? The first is the connection of two coils in separate circuits, but in physical proximity to each other and produce an EMF in one coil by passing a current through the other coil using DC. Then we're going to do exactly the same thing, connection two coils, separate circuits again, again in close proximity and further proximity, producing an EMF by passing a current through the other using alternating current. And then finally change the value of the induced EMF in a coil by varying the method of magnetic coupling. So don't forget to always do your risk assessment. Um, I'm going to reduce electric shock because I'm going to stick with ELV, extra low voltage, 24 volts AC and DC. In those low voltages, um, high currents are possible. So I'm only going to energize things for short periods of time because they could actually get quite hot if I leave them on for long periods of time. And I'm going to minimize trips and falls by keeping leads and things up off the floor. So here's my basic circuit. We're going to use a supply, a DC and an AC supply. I've got a rocker switch to turn the circuit on and off. And here are the two coils. So I'm going to be using these um, close together and further apart. So I'll be using these in proximity to each other. And of course, I also have a crow or digital oscilloscope which is going to allow us to see what kind of things are induced into a second coil depending on their proximity. So that's what the circuit looks like. So for DC, it's our DC setup to start with. We've got a DC power supply, this will be obvious. I've got that running at about 23 volts. I've got my on off rock switch and I've got my um, two coils. So here's my coils and they're in oh, they're really close proximity with each other at the moment. You can see here they're reasonably close to each other and then further on I have some iron cores which I will be able to drop in to change the inductive path and uh, increase the permeability between the two quite easily. You can see how they're connected up. The plus through the switches goes through the first inductor and then back to the negative or to the zero volts. The second um, is simply connected here off screen and back to my crow leads so we can display on the oscilloscope here what kind of voltages we're going to get induced and what they might look like in their wave shape. So here's the first one. Um, we're going to put uh, 200 milliamps through the switch through the DC and can, you can see that quite clearly here. There's the um, 210 roughly milliamps. Um, the voltage is actually quite low to get the kind of current, 3.9 volts. And you can see the kind of spike, and I've actually called it ringing, because as you throw the switch, the switch actually doesn't close nice and cleanly. It actually bounces a little and creates this ringing effect. So you can see the um, ringing happening here. And once the switch has closed, the magnetic field has built. I get a bit of back EMF at the beginning and the back EMF eventually drops off over time and reduces to nothing. So I get this spike which causes ringing effect which is the uh, mutual conduction between both coils in this particular case. So I am getting this mutual conduction across here, even though it is only air, 
conducting my magnetic path. So on the next one, you'll notice that we've uh, switching off this time. So our current is dropping zero. So we're turning it off. So the magnetic field is being turned off and we're still ending up with a smaller signal, but we're still getting this bit of a ringing effect. So again, we get mutual induction as the magnetic field builds up between the two, but we also get induction as the field collapses because we've turned off, which is what has happened here. And again, we're getting this ringing effect. So next, we've noticed that we've now moved our coils a bit further apart. So we've moved them 30 millimetres apart. So our proximity is to uh, give them 30 mil. They were almost touching before, and now we're giving 30 mil. You'll notice we're still getting the ringing effect, but it's much smaller because the magnetic field that is between these is much weaker because of the distance. So a much weaker magnetic field because of the distance of 30 millimeters between them. And then finally, the next step is to turn off again. And you'll, again, you'll notice that we've turned the current off and we've got a similar kind of ringing effect as we did last time, but again, far more reduced because this distance between the two coils is 30 millimetres, so our magnet field is much less. So you'll notice that the size of the induction, the amount of voltage induced has reduced. If we we're able to actually measure it, you'd find it reduced by the square of the distance. So further and further away, the less less induction happens in relation to the square of the distance. So uh, now we're going to put the iron cores in. So you can see the only difference is here that we've put the iron cores in and we've switched on the supply. So you can see that we've got our 200 odd milliamps flowing in a circuit and it's created much stronger spikes because our magnetic field that is in here is much stronger. There's a lot more magnetic field because the conduction path is so much easier because of the iron core. There's nowhere near as much air to have to travel through. A lot more of the conductive core travel through the iron cores in the middle. So the turn on spike is very, very strong. So we end up with this much stronger spike. Now we're going to turn off. And again, we've got a strong negative ringing spike. So again, this time we had current flowing and we've turned it off, so gone through the off cycle. But again, we end up with a strong spike. So the one thing we can certainly note from using the iron core is we still get strong induction, but it's the strength of the induction is magnified quite considerably because we have the iron core. Now we're going to move the two conduct the two coils a bit further apart again and you'll notice what happens now. It's a little bit different again. So again we've moved we've moved them our 30 millimeters apart. So that's the distance we've got between them. And we've turned it on, 
and we've got no spike. We've got no spike all coming across. So this air gap is too big. All the magnetic field is being short circuited very close to the inductor and none of the magnetic fields are actually reaching out far enough to get to the second inductor because we've put this air gaps now too much. So the gap here is too much and our cores are keeping the magnetic field strong but close, very close to the main inductor. But look what happens on our next one when we turn it off. So here we've turned the current off. So our current has dropped to zero. But as this magnetic field that had been established, it was a strong magnetic field when it was established, and as we've turned off, we've actually created a magnetic field even bigger as far as voltage is concerned. And we've got enough as it collapsed to create an inductive spike. You'll notice spike's not particularly big, but as the field has collapsed in this direction, rather than establishing, we have had enough flux to cut the coil and create a small spike. So we end up with no spike at current on, but we do end up with a small spike at current off. So let's now move into doing all that all over again. But this time we're going to use an AC supply. So this is our AC setup and we have an AC supply here, so I've obviously forgot to change the label here, it should say AC. So I've got an AC power supply, this is giving me 24 volts AC. I'm measuring the AC voltage here, so we can see it on my meter. And we have our two coils and our setup exactly the same as last time. The coils connected across to the AC. You can see them very clearly connected across. But I'm going to use the switch that's on the front of the AC power supply. And you can see our own cores here in the background waiting to be used. So that's our general setup. Hasn't changed very much. We're using the voltmeter to display the voltage it's being applied and uh, we'll see what reaction we get on our cathode oscilloscope. So here's the first one, putting in 25 volts AC, you see the voltmeter is reading 24 volts AC and we're getting quite a reasonable amplitude being induced so our magnetic field is building up on half a cycle collapsing and building up the opposite way so we've literally got this magnetic field oscillating backwards and forwards in this particular case every 20 milliseconds or 50 hertz so we've got this all happening every 20 milliseconds it's oscillating backwards and forwards so we're getting really good mutual induction across the air gap with our two coils relatively pretty well hard up against each other. So the next thing to do is to leave everything the same and just simply move them apart, put the 30 mil gap in. So here's our 30 mil gap. And you can see here, physical gap. And what's happened to our voltage? Wow, much reduced. So we're still putting in 25 volts into this coil. 
So that's the voltage across this coil. But our magnetic field now is very much weaker because of the distance it has to travel through the air to cut the other coil. Therefore, the amount of magnetism available has reduced. Therefore, the voltage that we have mutually inducted, reduced again, has reduced dramatically. Now let's do it all again with passion and you'll notice this time we've still got 25 volts but we've put the iron cores in now. So again nice and close but we've got iron cores and the amplitude is very high. So very strong AC, very strong AC coupling across because our magnetic fields have got plenty of magnetic field can be transmitted because the iron cores and their permeability means that we can have a lot more magnetic field operating between them so you can see a much much stronger coupling or induction happening between the coils So now let's take the same coils again, but now look, we've, we've moved them for 30 millimetres apart. So there they are, moved physically apart, still got the iron cores in them. And our amplitude of our signal has dropped considerably. It's still a 25 volt sine wave going into that particular coil. But the amount of induction is reduced because the amount of magnetic field has reduced because we've reduced, introduced a lot more air gap. So lots more air gap now, nowhere near as much magnetism and therefore a much reduced. So with our close together we got strong, when we moved them apart we got a moderate response. So let's do a summary and compare what's going on. So on the left hand side we have got the DC, so on the right hand side we've got 50 volts AC. And you can see with air, that's the air ones here, we got these ringing shapes and they got smaller and smaller and smaller as we got further and further apart. Then we put iron in and we got much stronger signals with the iron, stronger spikes, nice and strong spikes, but again they did tend to weaken off again once we started to introduce more air gap in what was going on. And we saw a similar thing happening with the AC. With the AC and their air gap, when we got close, we got a good strong AC coupling signal. And then we put the 30 mils in and it definitely dropped off considerably. We put the iron cores in and we got a very strong response. When they were close and with the iron cores very very strong and then we got a moderate response when we moved them 30 millimeters apart so what can we say what are our observations well the first was how was emf was developed in a coil when the supply was connected coil one well, what we can say is the voltage was developed in coil 2 through mutual induction as the magnetic field increased at turn on. When the change stopped, induction stopped. And you can, you can clearly see that there. So over this part, 
magnetic field is changing. But once the magnetic field had been established, but it was still on, our induction stopped because there was no longer any relative movement, so no voltage was induced. Only got induction when there was relative movement over this period of time, which is only a few milliseconds. Why did EMF stop shortly after turn on? Well, we've kind of semi-explained that already. The magnetic field only was changing as current changes at turn on. So once a steady current had established itself, there's no more change. So no relative movement, therefore no magnetic field changes, therefore nothing developed in the second part of the wave. So that's what we're saying here. Between here and here, all of this time in here, the magnetic field was on. You can see it here, it's on. But it has no more effect because there's no actual changing. It's not increasing and it's not decreasing. Therefore, no relative change. Therefore, no induction. Next, why was the EMF developed in the second coil when they were moved 30 millimetres apart? So what was going on? So as the coils are further apart, less lines of magnetic flux are cut by the second coil. The result is less induction and therefore less voltage. And you can see that clearly here on our two examples. Two coils close together and we move them apart and you can see the difference in the two wave shapes. So in this case, the two AC ones, and they're close together, you get a nice strong inductive connection. When they're further apart, you get a far less inductive connection. And then similarly, what effect did the iron core have on an induced voltage? Well, again, let's look at the comparison we have here. So here they are two of them close together. And we get, you know, a reasonably strong connection between them. But look, if we put an iron core in them, look at the magnitude of the wave shape. Much, much stronger. So providing the magnetic core, that magnetic path, increases the amount of magnetism, therefore increase the amount of induced voltage. Why was the continuous EMF produced in coil 2 with an AC supply? So the AC, or the alternate current, causes a constant relative movement of magnetic flux, and so continuous induction. So you can see that here on our digital oscilloscope. The voltage is constantly going positive, then negative, then positive, and then negative, then positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, all the way along. And it is that relative change which means the magnetic field here is constantly being built, collapse and rebuilt the opposite way. Collapse, rebuilt and built the other way. So the magnetic field is doing this 20, 50 times a second or every 20 milliseconds, constantly building up being released, building up, being released. So that's why AC worked well for transformers and things alike. So that brings us to the end of magnetism practical number five. I hope you've uh, had all your pictures and understanding verified through our little demo on mutual induction and how it works.